Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I am your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the ever-talented, ever-beautiful Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. My wife and I love our four children and want to learn to prepare them more effectively for the adult world. So we're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage listeners everywhere to weigh our guests' ideas on how best to cultivate in children a healthy relationship with money. We invite you to visit our blog at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our efforts to apply what we are learning on the podcast. This episode, we are interviewing Brian Dale Josephson, Group Vice President and CFO for Hager Companies. Brian has over 20 years of experience at both privately held and Fortune 250 companies in the areas of finance, purchasing, operations, sales, marketing, strategic business planning, business acquisitions, and integrations. Previously, Brian has been CFO for Rawlings Sporting Goods Company and CFO of Graco Children's Products, owned by the company Newell Rubbermaid. Brian graduated from the University of Utah with a BA in finance and accounting and a minor in Japanese, having learned to speak the Japanese language while doing missionary service in Japan. While completing his college degree, he married his high school sweetheart, Jacqueline McDonald. He and Jacqueline have six children. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with someone who has such an extraordinary background in and understanding of finance. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Josephson. Brian Josephson, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I got to ask you, you have been the CFO for a number of companies you've done. Uh, right now, you're the CFO for Hager. Yeah. You've been the CFO for Rawlings and for Rubbermaid. Uh -huh. Now, is Graco on that list as well? Graco was a part of Newell Rubbermaid. Got it. Okay. So it was under that umbrella. Yes. It's exciting. What is your favorite part of being a CFO? To me, it's the interaction with the rest of the functions. I'm not just an accountant with a sleeve protector and an eye shade in the back corner. I have to interact with all the different functions and make sure we develop some business acumen across the sales, marketing, operations, all those different disciplines so that they understand how their decisions have implications on the rest of the business. Got it. So, so the bottom line, this is how this is going to affect the bottom line. And exactly. you get to strategize with these guys. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Hager. Hager is about a $140 million business. It's 170 years old. The sixth generation is running the company now. Josh um, Hager, right? Josh Hager is the president. And it's just a great little business run by a great family. I think we are the second oldest business in St. Louis. Our neighbor, Schaefer Oil, is actually the first oldest business and in St. Louis. You say your neighbor just right here along the, right the riverfront. Yeah, right Oh, that's door. exciting. So oh, we excellent. stay in touch with them. It's kind of nice. And what does Hager do? Hager does commercial door hardware, so hinges, exit devices, door closers, all those types of things. Any hardware on the door, we do. Okay, so how do you keep yourselves passionate about a door business? That's tough. It is very <laughs> tough. But it's it's you know it's the competition. You know we look at yeah. our competition and we we want to be better or as good as them. We want to do better ourselves. It, it really is kind of an internal thing. It's yeah. a function of us really wanting to do the best that we can. And we gauge ourselves or we measure ourselves against the competition. That's kind of our measuring stick. But for the most part, we know what we're capable of and try to hold ourselves to a pretty high standard. Yeah, you said something a moment ago that really jumped out to me. It's an internal thing. And then I started thinking, you know what? One of the ways that you bring passion to work is by being really excited about the people with whom you work. Yeah, very much so. What, what's your favorite thing about working with these people? So, you know, back to the Hager family, just quality people. I mean, almost maybe to a fault, they have huge hearts. You know, sometimes people look at big hearts and business as being opposing factors yeah. in success. But I think they've found a way for 170 years, obviously, they've found a way to make that compassion, that love for the people be a differentiator for them in the marketplace. They have tremendous relationships with all their customers. They have great relationships with their team here. They bend over backwards for the team. And that develops, you know, an element of trust and an element of respect. People want to work hard for the Hager family because of that love that they feel from them. That's and good. That, 
you know, that's what keeps me coming to work every day and gets me passionate about door hardware. Not the coolest thing in the world, but <laughs> we want to be successful, help them be successful too. And yeah, I don't doubt that without this type of technology that you guys are developing, we would not have a lot of the wonderful things that we have. I think, I think that that's one of the things I love about economics is that you start to really see how things come together. Yeah. You know, has this been your experience? Very much so. It's really cool to see how we fit into the overall scheme of things. And we're still a relatively small player against some of the competition that we compete against in the marketplace. But it's fun to see everything come together and people work together for a common cause yeah. and see how it positively impacts the community as well. Now, you say small business, but you guys are international. We are. We're global. We have a sales office in China and we also have a sales office in Dubai. Wow. Not a ton of business over there. It's 8 to 9% of our total business, but we're looking to grow there because that's where we think there's some big opportunities as well. Definitely. Uh, well, it's it's exciting to be here. And personally, you're a big fan of sports. I am. Okay. And uh, your favorite teams? Uh, the Blues and the Cardinals. They have to be. Yeah. Uh, I love I love going to games here in town. I think we got the most passionate sports fans in the world, and uh, I, I enjoy that. It's really we do. Good. We do. I, I love the cards. I, you know, I'm a, grew up an Oakland A's fan and I'm not departing from that. But the fact of the matter is the cards and the A's rarely face off. Yeah. I can afford to go wholeheartedly with the cards. I'm teaching my kids to love the cards. Now, did you grow up in St. Louis? Nope. Grew up in Salt Lake City, born and raised there till I was about 19. Uh, went on a mission for our church to Japan, lived in Japan for two years. Came home, graduated from the University of Utah, and then got married in 1985, left Salt Lake in 1987, and been back to visit, but left there and never went back to live, and yeah. we live in St. Louis now, so we've been all over the country. Excellent. In Salt Lake, did you live in a more rural area, or were you in the city, urban? We was... were we were up on the kind of the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, so it was yeah. we were probably 20 minutes from downtown Salt Lake. So out in a little bit more of a suburban area. Tell me a little bit more about the entertainment like. I mean, what, what were you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, they really didn't have, I mean, Utah Jazz was about as big as it got for sports. But I remember the joke when we'd travel and we'd fly home, you know, the pilots always give you the time zone. You know, you, yeah. you're moving into a different time zone. Please move your clocks back an hour or two hours or whatever. Well, the joke in Salt Lake was when they'd fly into Salt Lake, they'd say, you're, we're flying into Salt Lake City, Utah. Please move your clocks back 20 years. Um, it was, it was a little bit of a protected community. Yeah. Well, so. that was where, uh, not, not in Salt Lake, but Provo, wasn't that where Footloose yes. was filmed? Yes, it is. That's right. Just so down has, by Provo. It, it, it just communicates that <laughs> stodginess. That backwards. That backwardness. You know, I, I don't remember that about Utah. In my days, I thought it was actually a really great place to be. I loved hiking those mountains. Yeah. There is, there is not too many other places in the world that has as much variety as Utah does as far as things to do in the outdoors. I mean, yeah. it's, you got hiking, you got boating and swimming and skiing, snow skiing, water skiing. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible place to go visit and, and have fun. Have you ever made it up to Lake Blanche? No. I don't think oh, I have. Lord, I think it's Lake Blanche. I gotta, I'll look it up and I'll put it in the show notes, but man, that place is gorgeous. Huh. And that's up there in like little, Cottonwood Canyon okay. or something like that. What were some of the places you remember hiking? Mount Olympus was right in my backyard, so we'd hike Mount Olympus a lot. There were trails down, you know, big little Cottonwood Canyon, Park City. We were up in Park City a lot. Mm -hmm. Loved all those areas. Provo Canyon uh, near Sundance, yeah. ski resort, all kinds of great hiking spots out there. Were you, you were a tough kid then. I don't know if I was a tough kid, but I was a, I was a fun kid. We had a lot of fun. Outdoorsy? Yeah, very much so. We were always out, you know, picking up baseball games, football games. We were always out playing sports. And then when we weren't playing sports, we were out running around in the fields, going hiking. Nice, nice. Your favorite sport to play when you were a kid? Probably football. I really loved football. I was a bigger kid. So growing up, I'd get to run with the ball and knock people over. So that was always fun. Okay. So to me, I'm already seeing this kind of weird contradiction where I'm like, okay, you're this tough kid, but you know numbers. <laughs> yeah. I like numbers. Okay. Like, did that ever get you beat up or how, how was that? No, it was funny because I loved being with people too. Yeah. But for some reason, I always gravitated towards math. And my dad was an insurance salesman, kind of in the finance business. I like him. Um, 
he was very good with numbers, but extremely good with people too. I always had this love for numbers, but I didn't want to get trapped into, again, that back office, you know, actuarial type that's never interacting with people. I love the people side of it too. So that's where I kind of gravitated towards more of an accounting and finance degree where I'd have that ability to interact with more people. When did it dawn on you that you had this love of numbers? Well, the numbers piece very early. My dad ingrained in us fiscal responsibility, if you would. Yeah. He ingrained that. I mean, we had to earn our own money. I paid for my old own football cleats and baseball glove. And he gave us opportunities to do it, but he made us earn our own. He wasn't paying for it. Of all the things that you saved up for, what of those things do you treasure the most? I mean, I was a big sports nut, so it was probably the sports equipment. Buying my own football cleats, buying my own baseball glove, my own baseball bat. That was kind of neat for me because I looked around at a lot of my friends and not a lot of them were doing that. Their parents were buying all their own equipment for them. And I was kind of proud of that. So that's that's something I look back at and I appreciate my dad teaching me at such a young age. Was there ever a time when you didn't appreciate your dad teaching you that at such a young age? Yeah, probably when I was in the moment. I didn't appreciate (laughs) having to work to earn that extra money to pay for my own stuff. All in all, I think it was a great, great baseline for me to learn. Give me an overview of your greatest sports moments. I don't know if this is a great moment or not. Maybe I shouldn't share it, but I remember (laughs) I loved baseball too. And I played on a lot of American Legion teams and we played at one venue. It was Churchill Junior High School. And the diamond sat in a situation where left field, 300, 350 feet out in left field, there was a very steep hill. Yeah. So if you hit the ball out there and it was on the ground, it roll up the hill and then it roll back. So it made it a little bit difficult to run. Well, I hit a ball really hard and, and I could hit the ball pretty well. I hit the ball hard and it made it to the hill on the fly, but it rolled up the hill and came right back. So what should have been in my mind, a home run ended up being a triple. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that I blame it on the hill, but I probably also should blame it on the fact that I was a little bigger than I probably should have been and couldn't run as fast as I wanted to, but it oh, was fun. awesome. So, so when you're, when you're running around those bases, do you remember kind of the feeling of stopping at third or do you, do you know, what was I do. That? I remember getting a step past third and my coach saying, stop. Down I was disappointed her. that I didn't get my home run. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that, that's that's tough, man. That's but you know at the same time it's commendable. I never in all my days of baseball never got anything close to a home run. Oh, I'm not right. even sure if I ever got a triple. You, you know, if you look at the confidence that you built from sports and the confidence that you built from earning your own money, yeah. buying your own equipment. Do you ever recall those things kind of building off each other in any sort of a way? Did it pump you to come to the game with like, dude, this time I'm going to try out my own, you know, new set of cleats or like, how how did those two feed off each other? I'd have to say they certainly would complement each other quite well. Yeah. You talk about confidence. Confidence in sports is everything. I mean, if you have the confidence, you're much further along than someone who lacks that confidence. And so my dad teaching me how to save money and earn things and pay for things on my own built some confidence in me, which I'm sure translated over to the field as well. If you have a little bit more confidence in certain aspects of your life, it's easier to translate that confidence over to the other aspects of your life as well. So yeah. I know there was a there was a connection there for sure. And I wonder if the converse can be said that if you have lack of confidence or if you have a bad experience in one area, if it yeah. may affect what's going on uh, in others. Uh, certainly. And, you know, in my church position, we do a lot of counseling and a lot of times you see that. I mean, spot on, right? Yeah. If if you've got a challenge in your financial life, it's hard for you to stay focused in your professional life or other areas. And it impacts in, in a negative way if you're not doing the right things, uh, how you perform at different venues. So if you've got a financial problem at home, you're going to struggle to perform as well as you could at work because of those strains that you're and, and stresses that you're dealing with at home. So I think it does complement it. Do you feel like your parents were able to lay a foundation in terms of financial stability at home that was helping you Absolutely. outside of the home? Absolutely. They were awesome. I, I remember, I remember uh, we had a cabin up in Utah. Yeah, and beautiful mountain. We decided on Sunday. My dad always went to church on Sunday, so we went to church, and I wasn't feeling like going to my own Sunday school class, so I sat with my dad, and we were sitting on the back bench in Evanston, Wyoming. They were talking about how to develop your children, how to train your children, what do they need to learn. And I remember the Sunday school teacher saying, what 
what is the most important thing you think you can teach your kids? And we were just visitors there. So first I was a little appalled that my dad would even raise his hand to answer. <laughs> but he did. How dare you? You don't exactly. know these people. Don't, don't say <laughs> anything, dad. I'm embarrassed enough already. So he raises his hand and then he says, I think the most important thing we can teach our kids is how to work hard. Yeah. And I was shocked. I mean, first off, he answered something in a, in a venue we weren't familiar with. Secondly, he used a four-letter word in church to me. Work was a four-letter <laughs> word. But it had a big impact on me from the standpoint of of all the things that he could have said. He said hard work, work ethic, learning that discipline. And, and that stuck with me ever since. I was probably 10 or 12 years old, and I remember that. And now I appreciate what he meant. You need to learn to work hard. You need to learn some basic disciplines. And as you do that, those translate across every aspect of your life. And you can find much more success as you build those foundations to start from. Any moments in your childhood when you would say that you were not a hard worker? Oh, yeah. I'm sure I had my lazy times when my dad had to get after me a little bit and my mom as well. I mean, for the most part, my parents were very good about building those baselines of discipline with us and work ethic that, you know, I didn't have too many of those moments. What kind of balancing act were they playing? You know, you seem like you would be a pretty fun kid to raise. But were there other kids in we, the mix? Like, what's, yeah. what, what are we talking about? Well, and that's maybe they were worn down a little bit. We had uh, eight kids in the family. I was the uh. fifth in eight kids. I had four older brothers, one younger brother, and two younger sisters. And so I think my four older brothers kind of wore my parents out to a certain extent. But I even look at it now. For me, I've got six kids, and it's a learning process. I wasn't perfect with the first one. It's amazing she turned out as well as she did Yeah, because I was a terrible parent to start with. But I learned, and I think my parents did too. They It was a learning process for them. So as the fifth kid, I think they did a that, great that's job about what they, <laughs> that where you start kid. to figure it's it out. It's the fifth kid, right? That's where you get it. Exactly. Well, that's that's good. In, in our modern society, when when parents are having you know two and three, you know something like that, I'm sure that hearing, it's you know, to learn. if you guys would just <laughs> stick it out, that fifth kid's going to turn out amazing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what they want to hear. <laughs> oh, my. That's awesome. Um, and do you feel like they they had much the same takeaway on the work side? And, it's you know, interesting. You can't speak for them, I suppose. But, you know, but right. Just, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. As I see them respond to the way my parents parented them, they each have a different perspective on how they were raised. I look at my experiences fantastic. Some of my brothers look at it as maybe a little bit prohibitive. Each one has his own perspective, but I look at every one of them as successful. They've all done great things. They've all built a very solid foundation, a good work ethic. I've got a brother who followed my dad into the insurance industry. He sells insurance and works really hard. A couple brothers who uh, served in the police department in Salt Lake and, again, had a lot of discipline. I mean, my sisters are both very, very well uh, respected in their various responsibilities. So I think we all benefited from the parenting we got from our parents. Do you recall times of mischief? I mean, you know, were you guys getting into trouble? Oh, yeah. I mean, five boys to start with. I mean, we were always pounding on each other and beating each other up. There were, there were times when we got out of control. My mother was in a wheelchair when we grew up. She had some back problems early on in her marriage and we had a two story home. Yeah. And so if we'd mess around and get into mischief, my mom would get upset at us and she'd come and, you know, try to grab us by the arm while we would run downstairs. <laughs> And she would have to get out of her wheelchair and scoot (laughs) down the stairs. She had a wheelchair downstairs too, but she'd scoot down the stairs and then get in that wheelchair. Well, lucky for us, we had a walkout basement. So then we'd run out the basement door and run back upstairs. Oh, that's evil. And then she, yeah, we were, it was pretty bad. (laughs) We're working on the uh, forgiveness part of that with my mom. (laughs) Oh, man. So she still, she 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 still still lives in Salt Lake. And does she hold that over your head? She, I don't, you know, maybe we've repented well enough because she forgets it. She doesn't oh, remember she's that. So good. So she's a good lady. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, you know, th- th- that's that's pretty uh, devious of you guys. It's Anything else? Any, what, what other stuff were you guys doing? We had a balcony up over our walkout basement, and we had a nice little ravine with some oak brush, some trees down in the back of our house. And we would stand up on the top of the balcony with a BB gun while the rest of us would run oh down gosh. through the woods and we'd try to shoot each other. We did wear <laughs> goggles, but we'd try to shoot each other with a BB gun. And uh, a lot of times we hit each other. It was pretty good. <laughs> it was fun. Oh, that, 
Oh man, no yeah. major issues though. I mean, I think we're all still. I, you know, I remember once when I was a little kid, my brother, my older brother, he's seven years my senior. His friends, they were all a bunch of rebels. And yeah. My brother had his BB gun, and I was terrified of him and his friends when he got his <laughs> BB gun out. And I just remember hiding under the bed once, oh, yeah. and one of his friends just poked the gun into their oh. snap. You know, he didn't know what he was going to hit. It could have right. been my eyeball. Yeah, you no know, kidding. Incidentally, it was my hand. We're all good, but it, but it's it's it smart. Oh, it yeah. really stung, and I remember it, le- it left this massive divot. And like I can still remember to this day, like it was weird. It was like it, it put this like kind of hole in my hand without breaking the skin. Ugh. You ever get something like that? Yeah. What was the, what was the worst like shot that you took? I, I pride myself in being a little bit smarter than maybe some of my friends, but, <laughs> but you a, were still shooting BB guns couple, at your yeah, brothers. We were. <laughs> but I had a couple of friends. They were brothers. They lived down the street, and uh, as we got a little older, we advanced to shooting twenty twos, not just BB guns. Yeah. And one of the older brothers said, you know, I bet I can repack this 22 with some clay. I'll just try to oh, take the lead out and pack it with some clay. <laughs> and his younger brother said, well, that won't do anything. It won't even go off. And even if it did, it won't go anywhere. Oh, the clay yeah. will just stay there. And the older brother said, okay, well, let's try it. So we packed it with clay. <laughs> and we were all standing there behind the brother with the gun, watching out in front of us the brother without the gun, who was bent over, you know, proposing a target with his back hand. <laughs> and sure enough, that clay came out of there and left a pretty big welt on that younger brother's backside. So. <laughs> that reminds me of my friends firing homemade potato, potato guns, guns at each other. <laughs> at each other. You know, and one of them, I guess he fired it directly at the other. And luckily, it split midair. Oh, and That's so lucky. both sides, you know, one raced by one side of his head, the other raced by the other side <laughs> of his terrible. head. I'm sure I'll write about this and say it many times over, but my mom had often told me, one boy, one brain, two boys, half a brain. <laughs> you know, so I think there's some validity to that. Some validity. And so the oldest five of you were boys. Yep. And then, uh, then any, a girl, a boy, and a girl. Girl, boy, girl. That's a really fun dynamic. Oh, the the fun. girls, how'd they do with that? They were good. I mean, they probably were tougher than us when we were all done with it because we oh, yeah? beat up on them when they were younger as well, just as hard as they beat up on us. So nice. They were good. They they survived it surprisingly well. That is hilarious. So you guys ever go sneak out of the house and wreak havoc? Yeah, those are areas that we may not want to get into because my mom might hear this later down the road. No confessions. Not okay, I'm no not confessions. asking <laughs> No, we, our parents were very good. They had strict rules. I'm not saying we always followed them, but you know, we were out and about late at night with some friends often. Yeah. More often than we probably should have been. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. I'll, uh, I'll share one with you again. Please. These friends uh, of mine weren't, well, I, maybe I wasn't the best influence on them either, but <laughs> we, uh, we had crab apples in our neighborhood. Yeah. And, uh, we would just gather these crab apples and get buckets full of them. And then we'd go to the, uh, local elementary school and it was a perfect spot to hide and throw crab apples at passing cars. And these are small little teeny things, but they make a funny sound as they hit the cars. And we had number a number of cars who would uh, slam on their brakes wondering what had happened, what hit them. And we were doing this one night, and uh, lo and behold, a police officer had gotten a call, and he came around behind us in his car and parked oh, in the back of the parking lot and then walked up on us as we had these crab apples in our big buckets. And <laughs> as soon as we saw him, we put the crab apples behind our backs, and he proceeded to interrogate us. And uh, we were trying to dump crab apples out of our buckets as fast as we could behind us, but it didn't work very well. It doesn't look natural. No, <laughs> not at all. Dude, so dance. we were we were nailed. Uh, he take you in? No, he uh, was very good. He said, uh, just good. don't do it anymore, and he let us go. That that makes me happy. I wish, in in a way, you know, I recognize there are limits, but I I do wish to see more kind of. For lack of a better way of putting it, sympathy for the troublemaker. Yeah. Because there are so many kids who, who do, or they're, they're just a little bit reckless and then they grow up to be CFOs. (laughs) (laughs) Present company included. (laughs) You know, and, and, uh, I, that, that is really funny. Now tell me, do you have any specific memories of like when your parents deliberately taught you about money outside of like you got to, got to make your own money for your gear. At a very young age, our parents would always give us an allowance. We had chores that we had to do, and based on those chores, they would pay us an allowance. And then as they paid us that allowance, they would sit down with us and walk us through maybe how to budget a little bit. 
very early on, they would open up a bank account with us. And so they taught us to, you know, as we earned money, there's a piece of that needs to, we'd always pay our tithing. For us, tithing is extremely important. Yeah. That was the first thing that came out. But then we'd also put a chunk of that earnings into savings account. And it was cool for me when my parents would take me down to the bank. I'd put that money in the bank and I'd give them this. And it was a hard copy. It's not electronic. This was the olden days, yeah. right, where they would put it in their little machine and, like a typewriter, print out the new balance. I don't even know what you're talking about. I bet you don't. <laughs> But I would hold that card and I'd put it in my pocket and I thought that was the coolest thing. That to me was very, very reinforcing to what my parents were teaching me. I could see that money accumulate and I could see the interest uh, ledger as well. So every line showed, you know, what I was doing with that money and how it was growing and uh, helping me be more financially responsible. It was really cool. You know, and that begs a really interesting question. And this isn't necessarily for you, but for all of us. And and that is how... In this very abstract world of money, yeah, do we make it more real? You know, because I like what your parents do. I like yeah. that you had to, a, kind of a physical reminder, and there's power yeah. behind that. But now, you know, particularly as we're stepping into the age of cryptocurrency and yeah. you know electronic banking, and you know where everything is online, how do you make that real? You know, the credit card. I've heard that one of the big problems with the credit card is that because it's divorced from any sense of Loss. Yeah. You're not giving it away like you would be a dollar, you know, a dollar bill or a five dollar yeah. bill. Then you're like, well, I, I give it to the machine and I take it back. And I, every time I give it to the machine, I get it what works. I want. Yeah. You know, so I kind of wonder about the importance of those physical lessons, those yeah. the tangible. It's, it's hard. I mean, we've, we've struggled with some of our kids on how to create that environment, right? Where, yeah. where it does make sense. Cause to your point, it's just as easy to wand this card through a machine and I get whatever I want. At some point in time, you have to then pay the piper. Yeah. And so how do we, con- how do we connect the dots for our kids or help them connect the dots for themselves on, okay, every time I wand that, that means at some point in time, I'm going to have to pay a bill. And yes. so getting that statement, sitting down with them, making sure they understand, okay, this, this happened three days ago when you wanded your card through the, the cash register for that candy bar. Now this is what happened. So now you've got to write a check or transfer some money out of another account and try to create that tangible experience for them that says, here's my dot connecting experience. Here's what happens when I get this good or service or whatever. And now eventually I got to pay for it. Yeah. It's hard. It's a lot harder. But for us, we've tried to do that with credit card statements and you know, bank account statements and those types of things. It's really good points. I mean, that, that, that is challenging. And I kind of wonder about that with my own kids. Like, you know, what am I going to do to really bring some of these things home? And I'm still brainstorming ideas that, you know, hopefully I'll be sharing with the listeners later. Great. Um, but I, I like what you're saying. Now, going back to some of those habits, what have been the lessons that have been so impactful for you as a kid that you have most desired to convey to your own children? We like the saying, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Yeah. Differentiating between wants and needs. Yeah. You know, we need food, we need a place to live, but we want lobster and steak. Yeah. We don't need it. And so for us, it's, we've tried to teach our kids that, you know, you never go into debt or you never, never overextend yourself for a want. Yeah. You may have to for a need. You may have to take a loan out for a car or for a home because you need that, but you shouldn't take a loan out for the next trip to Cabo, Mexico or wherever. That's a want. And so differentiating between those two, those are things that we try to do in our, in our home. And then, um, again, using things up. Baseball gloves. You know, I had to buy my uh... own. So I would use that baseball glove until it was falling apart. And then I'd try to restitch it and just buy a new leather string instead of, a whole new glove. You know, my cleats. I used my cleats multiple seasons. Not, I didn't get a new set of cleats every season. You know, those are things that we try to teach our kids. Clothes. I see a lot of kids these days wearing branded clothes. It's great. You can yeah. afford it, but I'm different. I, I don't need the Nike brand on my chest. Yeah. It's wonderful if you want it and can afford it, but to go into debt to get the highest branded shoes or clothes or whatever... It's just something foreign to me, and we've tried to teach our kids the same thing. Don't go into debt for wants. Go into debt for needs if you have to. In terms of keeping perspective, because it sounds like your parents taught you some very valuable lessons 
particularly in saving, that probably helped you keep some perspective about the importance of money. But what were some of the other things that helped you not to be spoiled about it? Well, I think the fact that I bought all my own stuff for the most part. I I mean, I, and my parents were smart about it. I mean, they were good about where I needed things and I didn't have the money to support it, like school clothes or things like that. They'd certainly pitch in for that. But for the most part, I bought my own stuff and it made me appreciate the things that I had. It made me appreciate more, I think, the fact that it wasn't just given to me. It made me appreciate it and it made me use it more. That whole use it up, wear it out, make it do it, do without. Money was an important thing for me. And so if I could make my money go longer, last longer, go further, that was something important to me. I think that was good. Has that translated into some of the ways that you think about your strategic vision for a large company? Yeah, I mean, and my kids sometimes call me cheap and I correct them. I say I'm very frugal. Yeah. There's a difference. There is a difference. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's all about return on investment. And yeah. for some people that return on investment is wearing a Nike shirt or having a high end car or something. Those things don't give me the return I need. What I need is a financial return, meaning I need to get from point A to point B. I don't need a Mercedes or a BMW to get there. I need reliable transportation that will get me there. And so for me, the return on investment is buying a good car that will allow me to serve its function, get me from A to B at the most cost-effective price possible. Do you find yourself, even in your routine purchases, being very analytical about that purchase? I really am. I like to go through the thought process of what is the return for me on this investment. If I'm going to part with this money, and not that I think money is all that important, but I want to make sure I'm able to provide for myself and my family for a long period of time. And eventually I want to retire and have plenty to retire on. So for me, every dollar I spend, I think hard about it. And I try to make sure it's going to bring me the return that I need in order to Make those lifelong goals realizable. Your dad was an insurance agent. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to figure out what in the world he was doing? It took me a little while, but when I got into, let's see, probably middle of high school, end of high school, I actually worked for my dad in his insurance agency, and that's how I funded my own college. That was another thing. My dad wasn't going to pay for college. If you wanted to go to college, you're funding it yourself. Wow. And so I went to work for him and sold insurance and then did some back office things for him. And and he made me earn it. And I earned enough money to put myself through the University of Utah. Do you remember that time at which what that actually was became clear? Because I, I had no idea what insurance was yeah. until, you know, I don't know, much later. Yeah. Like, or at least how it worked. Well, what are some of the points at which it started to dawn on you? Again, my dad was really good about making sure we understood a lot about the world. And so I would say probably middle of high school, he had pretty much explained to us what he did and how it worked. Um, you know, I had to pay for some of my, um, and my dad put me on his insurance policy as a 16 year old boy. Your premiums are pretty darn high. Yeah. And so his premiums went through the roof when I got on his policy. So I ended up having to contribute to some of the insurance. And that's when my dad explained to me that, okay, here's what it is. If you get in an accident, and it could be a pretty severe accident, the insurance is there to help you pay for that. You can't pay for it for yourself. So they, you know, you put money in and they pool that money. And whoever has an accident within that pool of money, they draw the funds out and help them get through that transition without severely negatively scarring their financial position. So. That's awesome that he explained that to you. And in my own childhood, I remember getting my license and I don't remember anything about insurance. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. There, there was no conversation. I feel now like I definitely did not appreciate that yeah. my parents were actually paying for me to have a driver's license. Yeah. If I'd known then what I know now, I think I may have been a little bit humbler about yeah. those things. And, you know, and I look at the premiums that we charge, you know, for youth, youthful drivers and, and with good reason. Yeah, absolutely. With good reason. Okay. Absolutely. Because, so because we're not thinking about the age to be driving. driving. Oh gosh. Yeah, exactly. And now that, you know, with texting, sending premiums through the oh, roof, it's tough. uh you know, that's a financial lesson I'm going to definitely ingrain in my kids. I'm yeah. trying to set the example now, like don't text and drive or don't even be on your phone yeah, and drive. Keep your phone in your you pocket know, or whatever. Yeah. Something, you know, I want to get, 
at least one more look at what are the things that you think that parents should be doing? What are the universal practices that yeah. you think parents should really be honing in on? I think it's important to teach your kids responsibility. You're not always going to be there for them. You know, it's weird because as you get to the age I'm at, I've got some kids who have moved out and they've done, now they're on their own. They've got a family of their own. And it's hard because you, you love those kids and you wanted yeah. them to need you, right? But the whole purpose of being a parent is training them and developing them so that they don't need you anymore, that they can live independently, that they can be on their own. So would you say so, that that desire to be needed may sometimes be not just way. self-serving, but get in the way? It's in the way of yeah, doing the right thing for your kids. Ah, yeah. And I think that's an important lesson that we've learned as we've, as my wife and I have tried to parent our kids. The goal is to help them be independent, not to be dependent. And yeah. uh, so all throughout their lives, we've tried to, you know, set them up financially, understand the value of money, understand how to manage your money. Don't let it manage you. Learn how to wash your clothes, learn how to cook, learn how to iron, learn how just basic life skills. Those are things that I think are they're important lessons for kids to learn because at some point in time, you're not going to be there. Yeah. Right. You won't be there for them. You can't have them be dependent on you because you're not going to be there. And so I think that's the challenge most parents have is letting go, making sure you recognize that the goal is to help them be independent, be able to live on their own. Have you ever tried explaining to them what a CFO actually is? It's interesting. They, they say you just count beans all day and they're, you know, they're probably <laughs> right for the most part. But. Oh, I have jacked. Uh -oh. oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, like if ever there were, you know, within a corporation, somebody who really needs to be looking strategically at things, you know, it is your CFO. Yeah. You know, the CEOs to me are the dreamers that have to be kept in check. Yes. And don't tell your CEO. No, I don't no. even know who it is. So I can well, say he's that. He's great too. He's awesome. So, but no, that's, that's true. They need to be the visionaries out there looking and the yeah. CFOs help them be a little bit more grounded. But yeah, no, I, I love the role I'm in. It's a lot of fun. But your kids have not really kind of like, dad, I really want to understand what you do. You know, a couple of them, as they've started school now, we've got, let's see, we've got three in college still. And so they, um, they're a little bit more curious now because they're trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up. Yeah. And so they've asked me some questions. In fact, one of their classes, which is a good one, I think, they've been forced to interview different people in different fields and they've interviewed me for the finance field. Yeah. So Does that kind of feel flattering though? It's like they didn't go for another CFO. They're exactly. like, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> how was well, that? <laughs> it was fun. It really was fun. You know, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I wish they would have done this on their own, but you know, it's a school project, so I can't feel too excited about it. But <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it was fun. And it, you know, it's interesting. They, both the kids that did it, actually all three of them that did it, express some interest. I mean, so it was fun to have that conversation with them. And if they wanted to become a CFO, what are some of the things that you would suggest to them? Math. You got to be good at math, okay. but then you also got to be good with interpersonal skills. You got to know how to work with people. Yeah. And so those are the two things. Not like accountants. You know, accountants, well, accountants, they don't need that skill. Yeah, exactly. They don't need that yeah, skill. Okay. No, right. some of them do, but <laughs> for me in the finance field and the CFO realm, it's it's much more important to be able to interact with the different functions and know enough about each of those functions to be able to talk intelligently and challenge yeah. accordingly so, as well. So, Incidentally, one of my accounting friends, and I love this guy, we were walking home from his uh, accounting class and he's like, yeah, my, uh, my teacher told me that inviting an accountant to your party is like telling two funny people to go away. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and good. then... He proceeded to explain to me what why that was thing. funny. <laughs> and I already That's laughed. Terrible. I was like, stop it. I get stop it. Stop it. I get it. Oh, good heavens. That's terrible. So, so if you, a CFO, what major, you know, what, you know, would you recommend? What so I got some, uh, so I got a finance degree from the University of Utah and that, that included some accounting classes, a lot of accounting core classes. Okay. And so that was good. It allowed me to get some basic accounting skills, finance skills. Then I went back and got my master's degree at Binghamton University up in New York. Those are fields that for a CFO, the MBA is probably one of the most critical paths you need to go. go got through. it. That makes a lot of sense. My last question for you is, what is your very favorite charitable cause? Hmm. I've got a lot of them. I, I work with the St. Patrick Center for Homeless. I work for St. Louis Children's Hospital. Um, 
I'm on their adv- uh, development board. Boy, there's just so many things. You know, I don't know that I have a favorite. Is there I, maybe I a like common thread? People. Yeah, I think just helping people, looking for opportunities to serve, to help people get through difficult times. Obviously, my church is huge. We donate a lot to our church, and we love that because they're worldwide. They're globally sending money to help, you know, Haiti, Houston, Africa, you know, all over the world. Uh, that's a little less tangible, you know, for me. I, I like the fact that in a local community, I can have an impact, too. Is there any advice you would give to people who would love to get involved in one of these two causes? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you something that I'm also working on. I'm, I'm the chair of a group that's working on a, a website called Just Serve. Yeah. And so Just Serve is an application we've built. Our church has actually built it, but it's a non-denominational platform where we connect people who need support in projects yeah. with people who are looking for service opportunities. So if you go out to justserve.org and you look up the your zip code, it'll tell you all the projects that are available for you to help serve. There's also an opportunity for you to put a project up there. If you have a group, a 501c3, that needs some help and support. In, and it has to be a 501c3. It does have to be, okay. to be a 501c3. And it's not a fundraising arm. It's more of a service arm. Yeah, but uh, you're looking you know, for volunteers. Exactly. If you have an organization that needs some help running a fun run or a you know some type of event that you're holding, this is a great venue for you to utilize to connect people who want to serve with projects that need people to serve under. And so, it sounds like this type of an app is not just St. Louis based. This is more universal. It's actually global. Global. That's excellent. And, you know, and I'm sure that. If listeners will look that there are always in every community, there's going to be an organization that wants to help the homeless. If I might yeah. share one more story. Oh, please do. It, I there, love that. There's opportunities to serve everywhere. You don't have to look very far. I remember it at the University of Utah, a friend of mine and I would walk across campus. We had a math class on one end of campus. And our next class after that was a PE class, which was all the way on the other end of campus. And I remember we both kind of looked at each other every day, walking up the across campus and we'd notice people were just kind of looking down at their shoes and you know walking to their next class oblivious of what was going on around them so we made it a point to just say hi to everybody and as we walked <laughs> by them we'd say hi and we got some pretty weird looks every once in a while but for the most part you could see people would brighten up and say hello back so just simple things like saying hello to somebody being aware of somebody acknowledging somebody those are simple things you can do you don't have to do this big wonderful thing of service. You don't have to give millions of dollars to an organization. You can serve right in your own community just by acknowledging people and saying hello to people and being friendly. What's heartening about that is that I think that many of us feel like if only I had more money, yeah, you know, I can make an impact. But I'm like, you know, I can affect someone's day very positively yeah. with a good attitude. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy and whatnot, but it's very true. Very true. Great. You know, and there are needs for it's volunteers, awesome. people who can give their time if they can't give their money. Yeah. Last I checked, everybody has 24 hours a day. Amen. All right. Brian Josephson, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Very nice. Excellent. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethenickel.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to give kids financial freedom.